Uh, welcome everyone to the virtual talk, How It's Made. This is the second in a series of three talks for sustainability in chaos, the North American hand paper makers, George Triennial. Um, this exhibition shows the works of 29 artists and is currently um, on view at the Robert C. Williams Museum of Papermaking located in Atlanta. A number of you probably have already heard of the museum, but if we have anyone that hasn't um, uh, heard of the museum, um, the Robert C. Williams Museum is part of the Georgia Institute of Technology, uh, as I mentioned before, in Atlanta, Georgia. And our mission is to collect, preserve, increase, and disseminate knowledge about paper making, um, past, present, and future. Um, we have uh, permanent exhibitions that cover the history of paper, um, Dart Hunter, who was the originating collector, and uh, from hand to machine, basically the mechanization of uh, uh, paper. And then in our changing galleries, we show um, things from our collections um, and we collaborate with artists and scholars. We also do uh, 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 rent it traveling exhibitions and that's the space that sustainability and chaos is located in right now. Uh, we also do educational programs and um, you know, anything dealing with paper, we want to be there and at the center of it. So um, now you know a little bit about uh, the paper museum, the Robert C. Williams Museum of Papermaking. Um, tonight we'll be hearing from Marjorie Fortison, Samuel Aguirre, Kristen Tordella Williams, and John Van Clark. Uh, Van Clark, excuse me. Um, as they discuss their pieces uh, featured in the show and offer some insights into how the pieces were made in, so in, into their process. Um, after the presentations, the floor will be open uh, for questions. So we'll hear all four presentations and then open to questions. So uh, Kristen Tordella Williams transforms everyday materials from recycled waste to natural elements and unearths their connections to labor, social justice, and the body. She has shown worldwide, most recently in Berlin. Um, she has been a resident at Salem Artworks in New York, the Tides Institute and Museum of Art, and Atelier M. Alten Schloss, in Germany. I know I messed that up. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, in 2023, uh, she claimed uh, second place in Lake City's um, Art Fields competition among over 1,000 entries for her piece, 40 Burnt Books. And um, Currently, she presides as president of the Mid-South Sculpture Alliance and serves as an associate professor of sculpture at Auburn University. So John, John Van Clark is a native of West Texas. He joined Angelo State University faculty in 1977. Uh, Van Clark has exhibited in more than 230 national and international jury exhibitions and has been awarded many prizes. Um, some examples of Mr. Van, Van Clark's uh, work include a 1,000 foot mural for GTE in uh, 1982 and a monumental bronze for the San Angelo Fire Department erected in 1986. Ben Clark has exhibited his work in many one-man shows as well. Um, Marjorie Fortison is a Minnesota-based artist and educator who addresses the universal experiences of loss and human vulnerability through her sculptural practice. Applying traditional craft techniques, 
her inherent use of materials and attention to process express ideas from personal grief and introspection to broad environmental concerns. Fortison has uh, exhibited regionally and nationally and is a uh, 2020 or was a 2023 McKnight Fiber Art Fellow and a recipient of the 2019 Jerome Visual Art Fellowship, as well as other grants to support her work. Her studio practice is in the historic uh, Ca Casket um, Arts Building in uh, Northeast Minneapolis. And last but not least, uh, Sam McGarry is currently pursuing an MFA in uh, furniture design at the Rhode Island School of Design and intentionally working with commercially available bio-based materials. Uh, the current environmental crisis does not allow for research to be exclusively focused on solutions that are decades into the future. Samuel's work adheres to a here and now mentality and is hyper-focused on material supply chains and means of production available today. So you guys are in for some great presentations tonight. I'm going to um, stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Kristen. Hi, um, and thank you for being here tonight. My name is Kristen Tordella williams um, I already had that great intro. So I'll just get to it. I wanted to share a little bit about myself. I grew up in Massachusetts, wandered around New England and New York for a little while, and then lived in Jackson, Mississippi for seven years and had a position teaching studio art at a small liberal arts college before I received my position at Auburn. When I was a kid, I was lucky to be in a very like DIY family. We had a lot of focus on making things, fixing our own house, you know, doing our own Halloween costumes, sewing, crafting, things like that. So that really inspired a long love of making um, from my family upbringing and adventure. So the top right photo is in the Casco Bay in Maine. The other thing I wanted to just preface um, the piece that's in the exhibition with were the series of works using my, um, my work genes. So when I was in undergrad, I worked construction and um, I outgrew uh, many of my work genes from the, that time. And I knew that you could make paper from them. So I was like, I can't get rid of this fiber. I can't get rid of these, you know, pants. So what I ended up doing was processing all that fiber into small pieces, not actually cooking or beating them yet, just having them dry in pieces. And then I used the seams to create um, the series, a series of cast iron sculptures um, one of which is seen on the right. And then on the left, eventually I rusted those seams and then cast paper over them. My two primary processes are cast iron and paper making. And I like to see where those two things can cross alongside um, this idea of preserving um, memories of labor, celebrating those memories of labor. Here's another example of those explorations. This is a series of cyanotypes and cyanotypes is a ferrous uh, process for photography. So this is again in that series of work. I don't have time to go too far into it, but it's available, uh, more information is available on my website. Uh, and some details. I like to also use digital technologies as well as analog technologies. When I was at the residency that um, Drusha mentioned, I was able to uh, in Germany and I was able to create um, a series of screen prints uh, and this is at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, these pieces are called spring timelines. This is idea of reemergence of renewal, but also that made all the sweeter because of its impending death. Um, this is these were made in the spring of 2021. I was barely able to make it to Germany, so I'm really really lucky to be able to spend time there um, making these based in research of uh, poetry about spring, and that led me to learn about Edna St. Vincent Millay, um, which then uh, I'm just kind of giving a little background. So that that's that's some of what was going on. At the same time, I was also building a paper studio at my new job at Auburn. So this is me with my students in the paper studio on the um, using our beater for the, for my student Molly's work. We were really, really excited. We had just got the beater on um, uh, the red piece of equipment is a custom built 
uh, press um, my technician fabricated for the studio. Um, and then here I'm finally beating up those denim jeans. So I like to cook them for an hour, two hours, an induction burner with soda ash. Um, it helps break down the fibers a little bit more. And in the beater, um, it takes about two or three hours to beat this kind of fiber um, in the Reina beater that I was able to get with a hiring grant. And fortunately, my paper making studio is in the same building that I teach in. So I can kind of have the beater running and go and check on it um, while I'm teaching. It really helps with time management. So I found I received the Tides Institute um, residency and I was like, I have to beat up all this pulp. So I beat all of these pants pulps into different, um, like separately, so I could preserve their colors. And in my backyard in Opelika, I use a vacuum table that I built many years previously to experiment with different compositions with the paper. I knew Eastport, which is also in uh, Down East Maine, where the Tides Institute is located. Um, the studio is very, is on an island pretty much, um, a peninsula, like an island that's connected with a causeway. So I was thinking about um, these blue colored denim jeans, not just as artifacts of my work, but also as a potential substrate for other information. So I wasn't exactly sure what I would do at the residency. It had been delayed because of my move to a new position. And um, I wanted to give myself something to work with while I was there. And I also was flying there, so I couldn't take my vacuum table. Um, I really have a great setup here in Alabama where I can pull my vacuum table outside of my studio um, and make paper pretty much, I wouldn't say year round, but I would say like maybe eight months out of the year. It can be kind of hot <laughs> uh, for part of the year. And then um, really pleasant. This is my favorite time of year to make paper. So my student Molly, um, who was assisting me pulling these sheets um, was a really, really great help. So I wanted to share these process photos because this is how it's made. And in the paper, the uh, vacuum table, there's, um, many holes and then the, underneath that there's ribs that run to the um, valve you can see that gets hooked up to a vacuum and so i layer over a plastic sheet to help provide uh, provide suction and on big sheets it helps really make um, a stronger bond with the fiber some it took me a while to figure out how to use this tool that i made <laughs> um but now i i use it a lot so we were pretty excited. We were having a lot of fun. Um, and on the right, I just dry these sheets on the concrete floor in my studio and they seem to dry. The smaller sheets dry relatively flat and the bigger sheets, they curl up a little bit, um, but I don't mind that. Some of the denim had a higher polyester content and was a little bit resistant to blending, but some of it was just awesome. So I made a variety of, these is three feet by four feet uh, sheets of paper and then went to Maine. So I shipped the paper to Maine. Um, I found this, when I was preparing for this presentation, I found this photo of myself in the canoe before it, getting up to Eastport. I just thought the um, connection there was pretty great because as a kid, I used to go to Maine all the time with my family. We spent a lot of time outside. Um, so it was a wonderful opportunity to be at the Studio Works Artists in Residence. I highly recommend this residency. It is fantastic place to live. You live right across from um, the ocean. So I was just having a great time. Part of what I enjoyed doing, and my parents were able to drop me off. So it was a really, really fun time. So I rented a bike. I biked around the island. I was taking photos. Um, my studio was the side of the, um, there's two studios in a side by side that are storefront studios. And my studio had a printing press, letter press, things like that. Um, and so it was really, really fun. So I was, I made a little bit of paper there, but a lot of what I was doing was experimenting again, furthering like rust and paper, iron and paper. How can I bring these two things together and create imagery that commemorates labor, the labor of the place that I was living. It was completely just a gorgeous place. So I spent a lot of time walking around exploring and taking photos of the environment, um, at different times of the day. So you can see some of these, I'm gonna have to skip pretty quickly. It's just such a beautiful time to be there. Um, I found a lot of inspiration in spending um, time outside. And when you look at the paper, I mean, the paper that I made was just a, like, the, the denim jeans were a wonderful reflection of the seaside um, environment and just beautiful at all different times of day. Eastport 
uh, in my research in the Tides archives, they have extensive archives um, about the area. Eastport was, uh, the main industry there was sardine, sardine fishing. And all of these piers and weirs, there's all these canneries and the evidence of that um, activity was still in the landscape. So this is a, a, an older photograph I pulled from their archives of um, the sardine piers. The industry collapsed um, and is no longer. And then here are the piece, the finished pieces that are, um, this is a whole series. I made 11 of them based off of photographs I took around Moose Island, which is where Eastport is located. And you can see um, the end result here. Um, and this, uh, these are exhibited in a staircase in a show I had last summer in Missouri. So here are some of the photographs of the piers that I was taking um, around the island. Once I kind of narrowed down what evidence, what kind of like mark making that I wanted to incorporate with the paper, I then went out with a higher resolution camera than my cell phone and documented them um, from different angles, from different parts of the island. And I was really seeking out these evidence, this wood, this like rotting wood that was along the shoreline. And then back in my studio, oh, it was such a nice studio. Um, I borrowed their projector and because I didn't have that many digital tools at hand at um, in the studio, I just projected them. I projected the images um, and created the composition that way and basically traced them with um, an iron paint onto the paper. So uh, the image on the left is before I rusted the iron, like. It, and you can see some of my experiments around the paper. And then on the right is the staircase going up to the second floor of the studios. And I used the staircase because I didn't have that much wall space in um, in my studio. And I needed some place so they could hang and I could rust them. So I rusted them. I kind of rusted them aggressively, more with like a material called rust juice, just like a very basic concoction of hydrogen peroxide, vinegar, and salt. You spray called rust juice. Here's another, this is, um, you can see this is the photo that was used for one of the pieces in the series. I just was so taken with the landscape in Maine. It's, it is absolutely beautiful. Um, and you just go walking around the island at different times of day. And it, it was just a gorgeous land, like sometimes very um, haunting landscape. You can see here the photo on the right or the, the um, piece on the right is that image. And then this is the piece that was accepted into the triennial. I feel really grateful to be exhibiting um, alongside such a great group of artists. I hope I'm not over time. I don't think I am. Um, I wanted to briefly mention this other piece I was working on at the same time um, and relate that back to Edna St. Vincent Millay. So again, I'm, I'm investigating all these different um, avenues for how to bring rust and imagery and memory together and impress like that ephemeral moment and preserve it. And so the um, pieces on the left hand side of these diptychs are all embossed flowers and the, and the images on the right, the letter are embossed letterpress um, poems that I selected from Edna St. Vincent Millay who grew up in Maine and wrote many poems with metaphors of the Maine landscape and was a um, ardent feminist and a just fantastic, inspiring individual. Uh, I felt a lot of um, connections with her. Setting her words and poet in in letterpress meant that I literally touched all the words that she was choosing in her sonnets, and then had that kind of like deeper. I really had to closely read them because you think that you have it spelled correctly, and then you proof it, and you're like, well, I misspelled that one, or that C is backwards. Um, so the blind, I did blind embossing and then dry brush with that same rust material to create um, a more con more contrast on the page, as well as to again bring that rust, bring that iron into the the paper. And iron to me is like a representative of blood, of the center of our earth, of um, also industry. So there's a lot of really great connections there um, with the landscape of the body and and nature.
Um, here's a little bit of making paper in the studio. I had some, I had some dried pulp and there was a blender there. And um, Kristen McKinley, who runs the residency is very supportive of paper making. And so I was doing some paper casting there too. Um, and I was able to do um, some paper making using the pulps that I brought. And here's some uh, photos of the typesetting process and what the paper looked like with just some blind embossing. And then here's um, some more examples of the floral embossing. That was really fun. I would go out and gather flowers and emboss them at the same time. So I just wanted to give you a little peek inside my process. When I'm at a residency, I tend to really try a lot of different things and combine them. And it wasn't until I got home that I figured out that the flowers and the poems belong together and created that display. A detail. So the the image with the rusting, it kind of develops and there's a, there's a little bit of a loss of control um, as well um, with that kind of process that I really enjoy where some some letters come out forward, some some fade behind the rust and um, I really appreciate that. So before rusting and after rusting and the front and back of the paper. So that's a little bit about me. I would just like to say thanks to um, the Auburn University College of Liberal Arts Summer Research Grant, which supported my work at the Tides, um, Molly Work for assisting me, and all the great folks at the Tides Institute, as well as the Robert C. Williams Paper Making Museum, the North American Hand Paper Makers. I really appreciate being um, a part of this community. It's been very inspiring to share paper making knowledge um, digitally and in person, as well as to my family. So I'm very grateful. So thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Next, we'll hear from uh, John. Uh, yeah, that's the piece that's in the show. And uh, sometimes I didn't come up with this name, is, but uh, uh, they've been described as war machines. <laughs> but actually, it's a commentary on industrialization in general. Uh, and my use of paper making is just that it's a plastic material plastic being malleable uh, that I'm, as a as in teaching you know he's always looking for something that is not quite as pricey as you know or uh, labor intensive as working in metals or other things and of course paper make with paper it's a uh, readily ma available material uh, and so when we do have a hollander beater and uh, uh, we uh, create a pulp that uh, we apply into a plaster mold and this originally original pattern is made out of clay and then a plaster mold is applied in which I'm going to show you a small plaster mold and then the process that I use for applying the paper pulp uh, into the mold. There's a YouTube video of paper casting where they kind of fling it in there and then they use a sponge to press it out. Well, my process is considerably different from that. It's kind of more hands-on. Uh, and then of course, uh, putting dyes and pigments in the paper, that's uh, one way of doing it. But I just simply take the resulting casting and uh, seal it off with uh, coats of white paint or whatever, and then uh, use a uh, uh, initial application of a dark pigment and then dry brushing on top, scumbling and dry brushing to reveal uh, the small details, et cetera, uh, that, that uh, the paper casting is precise enough to be able to achieve uh, the kind of, of small details uh, that I'm about to show you here. Like in the wheels, got those from uh, going to a garage sale and buying a Tonka truck or some kind of truck, plastic truck, uh, for a quarter and then taking the wheels off and making plaster mold of that. So even the lug nuts show up in the casting process. It is that, uh, that much of a uh, uh, precision process. Uh, paper for me is really uh, desirable because it is uh, com coming up with a product that is really quite durable. I have cast this thing in ceramics uh, as well, but the, with ceramics, it's a very delicate material. I think 
one reason why I have the paper is, you know, you can take it and, you know, throw it across the room and just bounces. Whereas a piece of ceramics or some of the other more delicate materials kind of break up. But the point is that it's a nice, durable, lightweight material that I can put in a box and ship across country at very low cost. And uh, uh, this is how I'm able to send sculpture out in a lot of different directions and pack and crate and, and, the, and send it out with uh, without having tremendous weight. I, I car stone, I work in metal, I do all these other things, but though the costs in boxing up, crating up and shipping out, it can be uh, quite staggering, but that's a beauty part of the paper process is it's nice, sturdy, and very wonderful painting surface. And, uh, and then of course it's uh, lightweight and uh, shipping costs are way down. Uh, and I have a number of other things that I'll go ahead and step into pulling a mold out and talking about pulp a little bit uh, whenever. OK. All right. So uh, here I am holding up a little jar of uh, paper pulp. I'm going to really get my hands dirty here, believe it or not, doing this little demonstration here. OK, <laughs> here's paper pulp right here. And I'm going to make, you know, do a demonstration on how my process with casting is a little bit different. It's just kind of what I came up with just to see how precise it is. Um, before I do that, I'm going to show you uh, an example of a piece of firewood. Oop, there it is. Piece of firewood. It's not a piece of firewood. This is cast paper. Well, I just put plaster on the fire on the firewood, two piece mold, separated it off and then put a layer of the pulp, this dripping pulp there, uh, in into the mold, and after a little, you know, overnight, it dries, and I'm able to separate it out. But I'm going to show you a little bit about how I go ahead and attack that. Now, these things back here, these are also more of my crazy machines, my ruined, crazy uh, commentary on industrialization with these rusty surface yeah here my rust is created just simply by <laughs> acrylic paint <laughs> okay uh, and of course here's underneath it's hollow and hollow casting the way we would do in bronze or whatever but this is a another thing with wheels and uh of course it's just a lot of fun to paint these things and so uh, uh this is a again a real light process but and then of course you know various other cast paper items it's just it's just a really great material to work with you know sometimes it does get bumped around and cracks sometimes there are real cracks instead of the <laughs> a fake cracks that i put in on it to make it look like it's a, a ruined piece uh, but you know i even have a little bit of bronze here i do bronze casting as well this is kind of a bronze piece there and so uh uh, I I work in a variety of materials, but I think paper is just a very satisfactory for uh, doing some kind of uh, lightweight, very durable material. Uh, I work with ceramics and stuff, but uh, uh, paper seems to have a lot of advantages as well. There's this other piece here that I have that... Uh, I even put a sort of organic wound into and combined with the machine parts to it as well. And of course, it's all the sections are stuck together like this. And of course, here's my Goodyear wheel attached to it. And you can maybe get a glimpse of the lug nuts down and through here. So, uh, and of course, a number of other pieces in the back there. But I'm going to go ahead and show you my mold for the wheel, the wheel part. And it's just plaster poured on top that plastic wheel. And it's a half wheel because, you know, when you buy a, a uh, toy like this, you don't find both sides. It's hollow on the inside and you only have that outside area. So I cast two, put the two halves together to create the whole wheel as I have in the sculpture. I have a Another one where I have a finished casting and I'll pull that. Uh, I take this pulp and the way I describe it to the students is to make pulp work. And those of you that 
know about the Hollander beater, you know, or even using a blender, you have to have plenty of water. Okay. And I call this process of using water. And, and this pulp that I use, by the way, I don't use any glues or anything like that. And I will just take, you know, those bags of shredded documents that you see in the hallway outside of an office for the custodial staff to take and resell. I use shredded documents, but I will also add cotton balls and other things to uh, enhance this uh, quality of paper, uh, more archival than just, but I've had students make paper out of paper bags and newspapers and all kinds of stuff. You know, you've seen the uh, demonstrations of casting with tissue paper as well. You know, it's, there's all kinds of ways of doing it. But my way, I break it down into a pulp and it makes sure it have plenty of water in there with it. And I call this process of having plenty of water and just driving to students and it uh, is scaring the porcupine. If you take a porcupine and they're asleep, the porcupines are asleep and you try to push them together, guess what? They bounce off. But when you frighten the porcupine, guess what? The bristles come up and throw those together, they lock, okay? The pa paper is nature's Velcro. And so uh, the uh, process is if I squeezed out some water out of one of these pieces of paper, squeeze it out, and then you separate it out. Look at all the strands coming off of that. That's the porcupine pull holding it together. Now, I've squeezed the water out. These porcupines are now asleep. They will not. I don't use glue. I just simply make sure that the paper is wet enough. Okay, to to allow for it to uh, uh, separate the fibers enough. So just simple pressure is all I use to uh, make it solid. So what I'm going to do is, as I say, start off. In, now I have a little bucket. I'm going to try to capture the water with it. And uh, I just simply place it. Uh, and, and I have large release I do this as well but I'm going to do this with a small thing and and I'm just put, going to put some of this pulp right down now in the YouTube demonstrations they'll take it and fling it and then they'll go and try to use a sponge and sponge it out I don't use any of that stuff but initially I will go in and simply just kind of spread it out lightly going in there and then as I get it spread with appropriate thickness and the appropriate thickness is determined by what the pulp feels like as you spread it in the mold. In other words, if you press your pulp and it feels real soft, you can see water's dripping out of it already. You have to make sure you start off with it good and wet. And once you start pressing around, if it feels hard, what does that tell you? It's real thin. Okay, so put more pulp in there. If it's feeling kind of soft, well, you need to press on it more or spread it so that you have a sort of a fairly consistent layer in there. And you, I just do it by hand, pressing and squeezing. Now, uh, with this small mold, I can just about do it all just by pressing with my fingers, but in a bigger, there's more water coming down there uh but in a bigger uh, situation i use paper towels now i found and i don't know what the physics of this is but if you wad up the paper towels and put several layers on it it's just not as absorbent it will not pick up as much water if you just simply put a single a layer down you put a single layer down and it's super absorbent so that's the a little trick there that I've learned that a lot of paper makers will use sponges to press things. I don't use a sponge, but I use paper towels and press press that paper pulp right down in there and you get a kind of a, a more even application. And I just keep pressing until I just really can't get any more water out. Uh, I can do a lot of that by just simply... Uh, pressing with the fingers. And like I say, if it feels hard, you know that's real thin. It's real thin, 
you need to maybe put some more in there. So it looks something like this to get started, but I will cover the whole thing up and have it a little bit thicker on the outer edge so then it just pops out like that. I'm gonna sit overnight. I think if you dry, try to dry it a little bit too fast, it maybe and a larger piece will have a tendency to warp. But here's a piece that's I have it already dried out and it just peels pretty readily. I've already popped it out of the mold. It's a, but you can see here the kind of precision you can achieve with with this. You can see the lug nuts on that. Right? There it is. Huh. I even kind of like the, the you looking at this fragment like that. This gets me excited just to see that fragment just like that. And you can see it's just a real lightweight precision casting material. And this just opens up a world of all kinds of possibilities and, and uh, uh, options that you can use with this. It goes in here like this. But notice the outside is a little bit thicker because when it dries, where does it dry out the first? Out here on the outer edge, that's where it dries out first. So I go ahead and make it a little bit thicker on the outside edge there so that when it when this outside dries. Also, another reason why I want it a little bit thicker right here on the outside edge. Why? Is because when I try to remove this, if there's any kind of little bit of stickiness to this, you know, I'll be prying up against that. And if I have a little bit extra reinforcement there, that I have a little bit of a fighting chance of pulling it out without the thing tearing up. See what I'm saying? And I'll go in and, and then I, even though its surface is a little bit irregular, this is now really easy to shape and sand and all that. And one thing about this, if you don't like your casting or something's wrong with it, you know, just you can melt it down. Well, melt it down, uh, put it back in the in the in the water barrel. Once you paint this, though, you can't really bring it back. It's sealed and you really can't uh, re recycle that. That was what I found. So uh, there's a so this, uh, like I say, is cotton balls with shredded documents and I get this sort of a kind of a whitish color with this once it dries okay that's what that looks like there you can see from behind as I move there all the kind of constructions and machine parts and sculptures that I have here back back behind me there they're using a lot of different kinds of materials there okay so anyway I, if I've covered the information here I really got into the how it's made part <laughs> maybe more uh, than some of the other presentations. So anyway, uh, scaring the porcupines is my little code description on how I do my process. Okay? Thanks, John. All right, for you. All right, real good. Glad to be here. Good to see the rest of y'all, okay? Uh, now we're gonna go to uh, Marjorie. Hi, everybody. I'm Marjorie Fidesen, and um, I'm really grateful to be a part of this tonight. Thanks for coming, and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what I do right now as an artist and um, how the work that's at in uh, sustainability and chaos is made. So one thing you should know is my background is um, theater. I I was a design major and then worked for almost 25 years in professional theater as a scenic artist and a prop person. And that informs pretty much all of my art practice. I have been practicing art for about 10 years and I learned uh, how to make paper about six years ago. Um, I tend to work large in installations, but the work that I created for sustainability and chaos and all of the work or most of the work of that time was during the uh, pandemic and all of that was very intimate work. So let's get started. So here's the piece that um, is in sustainability and chaos down in Atlanta and before. And so I just wanted to familiarize you with that so we can um, think about that as I'm talking about everything else. So I 
first was introduced to paper and had never seen anybody use it or create it before, um, going to Haystack a School of Craft in Maine. And there I was taking a fiber class, which is really my roots are in fiber arts. Um, from Tanya Aguinaga, and we were studying all these different ways to manipulate fibers, especially twines and rope. And next door in the paper studio, Jocelyn Chateauvert was teaching an overbeaten abaca class. And every day I'd walk through the studio and see these amazing creations that the people had been making. And overbeaten um, abaca, for those of you that don't know, it's in a Hollander beater, like Kristen showed us earlier, for about four hours or more, depending on how much you want it to shrink. And so what happens is the fibers get smaller and smaller, and then as they dry, they shrink more and more. And so I became a pest in this paper studio, and Jocelyn gave me a bucket of pulp and sent me back to the fiber studio. and encouraged me to work with that pulp and see what happened in that first piece that this, this piece at the bottom, um, oops, sorry, um, is the very first piece I created uh, using paper pulp. So while I was working with Jocelyn in her studio, I went down for a residency for one week and she taught me how to make paper, well, how to beat paper, how to make paper, um, and then how to manipulate paper. And I came back with so many ideas that I tried out in the studio, but the thing that was most engaging to me was the rolling of this thin thread. And um, I just couldn't get enough of it. I didn't know what I was going to do with it, but I used the overbeaten abaca. I would go into the um, studio and create sheets of, I'd make maybe 30 sheets of paper each time. And then I would go back to the studio and cut it into strips and roll it into this thin thread. So it said in that last slide that I made over 8,000 um, yards of paper thread in this fashion where you see the hands of the children and adults working. Um, so over our open studio weekend, which is called Art of World in Minneapolis, um, about 70 people came and sat around my work table and helped me roll probably about 200 yards in that weekend. Um, and the rest was done over nine months in by myself in the studio. So it all came together. This I was part of um, a fellowship, the Jerome Fellowship, here in Minnesota is for emerging artists. And so this was 2019. And this piece is titled Home 46 Order Chaos. My work is a lot of, has to do with a lot of um, emotional trauma that I experienced in my life and the sense of loss. And this piece represents the chaos and volatility of my home life as a child. And then when things would get rough at home, I would leave and run down to the beach. I grew up near Lake Erie in Dunkirk, New York. And the beach was kind of my safe place and where I learned actually to construct things. So I would take all the detritus that would wash up and create, basically create installations on the beach as a child. And so the meaning behind this in that piece of slate that's on the right side of the screen is um, I took my mom's ashes back to Dunkirk in 2019. And while I was there, I visited my favorite beach, my childhood beach, and sent home boxes of slate with the thought that it would anchor this piece for the exhibition. And you can see this is probably the first thing I ever wrapped. This piece of slate was the first thing I ever wrapped. And Echo Chambers was kind of a prelude to Freeform, which is in the exhibition at um, the Robert C. Williams Museum. And Echo Chambers was made the year after my mom passed away. And I still kept a lot of her clothing, articles of clothing. And I um, had 
things from my dad, a pair of pajama bottoms and a thermal shirt that I had kept after he had passed. And I decided I'd do sort of a memory meditation on my family. And I asked my sister to send me some things of hers that I could wrap. So these are more, instead of the thread that I made for echo chambers, these I rolled slightly thicker and you can see that on the image on the right. Um, and I would take the articles of clothing and wrap and fold them into bundles. And then I would roll yardage of this paper twine and carefully and methodically wrap the pieces, the dresses or things that I was using, my mom's pajamas, um, some of her hats, and then let them dry in the studio. And when I'd come back, the thread, because it was overbeaten abaca, would shrink around these um, pieces of clothing and um, kind of contain them. And so then I would carefully remove the clothing from the bundles and they created kind of um, these memory chambers. And so the piece on the left is chopper mittens. And my dad used to wear the big chopper mittens. Um, for those of you that live in the South, chopper mittens are these big leather mittens that have woolen inserts that keep your hands extra warm. So I didn't have my dad's mittens, but my husband just so happened to have a pair of chopper mittens since we live in Minnesota. And so I borrowed his and wrapped my, the mittens. And when I removed, and while I was wrapping, I was thinking about how when I was young, my dad and I would go for walks in the winter. And he used to do, to keep warm, he would do this thing where he would hit his um, biceps. He'd cross his arms over his body. And there was that rhythmic sound that he would make and the thumping of the leather against the wool coat and the smell of winter on your clothes when you come in the house. So it was very evocative and very, um, oh, just a tender memory for me. And the piece on the right is a little black dress that my sister used to wear when we would go out in New York when we both lived there in the 80s. So she sent me that dress because of the memories from that. So here's free form. And this was made a couple of years later, and it um, it became a way to honor a friend of mine who had died by suicide during COVID. And so she and I are were the same size, and I have a lot of her clothing still. And actually, I when I was kind of thinking about what I wanted to say tonight, I noticed I'm actually wearing a pair of her jeans tonight. Um, so I took her clothing and did a similar memory meditation of thinking about my friend and our conversations and the things that we shared as I wrapped the, her clothing. And this is the piece that's in the Robert C. Williams gallery. So thread, then twine. And now there's the illusion here, I have more twine or almost rope and it's heavy things was created during the pandemic. And all of those things were found on walks that I would take many of them with my husband, but some of them on my own. And I bring in the illusion of um, this, fragile paper precariously holding a granite block or um, this giant piece of wood that I found on the beach in Lake Michigan um, when I was in Milwaukee for an exhibition. And so I wrapped those things and hung them in my studio and um, they represent the things, all that heaviness that we carried. And on the far left, I don't know if you're able to see it, but there's an empty bundle there that represents the things we have lost from the pandemic, all the loved ones we've lost and the people who are gone. 
So again, this wrapping stays with me and this branch um, is from our home. Um, our house is over a hundred years old and this branch has been in my studio for about 10 years. And I finally figured out a way to um, display it. And so again, I used cable that's wrapped into, so steel cable is wrapped into the paper tw twine to give um, a secure bond to the piece that's hanging. And this was a precursor to what comes next. And so at that same time during the pandemic, not only were we losing our, you know, just our way and our friends and family members, but we ended up losing a, an ash tree to emerald ash borer. And I knew I had an exhibition coming up at a sculpture park in town. And so I wanted to honor our ash tree. And I asked the um, forester and the engineer if we could actually display an ash tree from their property that needed to come down and that there was a big hard no. And um, so I thought about how can I create the sense of an ash tree. And I ended up wrapping the ash first in muslin, which you see on the left image is the right side of that image is the tree branch wrapped in muslin to protect the paper from getting dirty, but also um, it's a beautiful skin and I still have all the pieces and may end up stitching them together to create a second tree. And then on the left is the um, paper that's popped off of the tree. So much like John was casting in molds, I was casting on the actual piece. And then the image on the right is um, the, the first piece from the trunk. And again, this is in Abaca, only it is um, one and a half hour beat in Abaca. So it didn't shrink a lot. It shrank just enough to capture the texture on the branches and logs. So here it is ready for install. That's my buddy Stan. He helps me do my big installations. And you can see kind of the theatrical scale that I work in and I tend to do that. Um, and there it is installed at Silverwood. What was amazing is that floor has the rings of a tree in the terrazzo that's there. And so the the way those two things, my work and the space itself played off each other was just so beautiful. The other um, element is in the daytime, there was snow outside and around all those open windows um, were stands of birch trees planted. And so it was just this beautiful give and take complementing each other from the inside the gallery and outside in nature. And there's another view. And so wrapping. So I've gone from thread to twine. And most recently, this last year, I was a McKnight Fellow here in Minnesota through the Textile Center. So I was a fiber artist McKnight Fellow. And um, I spent the year circling back to the things I learned at Haystack, which was a lot of fiber techniques it crocheting, knitting, things like that. And I, because this was a fiber art fellowship, I really wanted to kind of flex my fiber muscles. So I spent about eight months um, arm knitting or gauge knitting five eighth inch rope, cotton rope um, in my studio, creating these huge panels that are hanging in the gallery. And then I also wanted to, I've been experimenting for about two years in casting rope in paper. And I had some success or no success. And then finally I figured it out and I started casting these panels of rope in one and a half hour beaten abaca paper. And this is the reverse side, once it dries, I would then pull it out 
and you can see the reverse side um, in the right panel, the right image. And then here are the works on display at the Textile Center. And that's what I've got. Thank you so much. I'm so um, grateful to be here and grateful to the Robert C. Williams Museum and the North American Handmade Paper Makers Association. Thank you, Marjorie. Such great talks. It's good. It's it's fun to see <laughs> behind the scenes. Thanks for sticking around, everyone. Um, I'm the anchor, so I'll try to go through this and respect everyone's time. Uh, I'm Sam McGarry. If you missed it in the beginning, um, I am a second year grad at Rhode Island School of Design in the Furniture Design Program. My process and path very much started in design and not even focused on paper, but just focused on compostable materials, pre-industrial materials with um, a current commercial application. And the whole premise of my work was and still is finding ways to use existing supply chains in a sustainable way. So that usually means pre-industrial materials that have an existing supply chain. Um, very design-minded, very design-focused, and it was actually through paper and the paper studio at RISD, who, which is run by and founded by Daniel Heyman, that really started uncovering a more artistic practice for myself. And just the deeper I get into paper, the more I'm in tune with that part of my practice. So I think you'll see that in the progression of this project um, for Sustainability and Chaos, Chair 3, I'll start a little bit about all the iterations that I went through, and then I'll show you the process behind the object that's actually in the show, and then maybe a few objects if we have time um, of what I've made since then. So this was the first chair that I made. The prompt for myself was how do we, or is it even possible to create compostable commercial grade furniture? That's my history before design, uh, working in the commercial furniture industry and just seeing what these objects are made of, how long they're used for, and the disconnect between how long they actually exist in the world. So I really wanted to focus my entire time at RISD, just seeing if that's a problem that I could solve. It started with this chair. Um, I called it the Frankenstein chair. It was very much an exploration of what could be possible, uh, what could work. So different joinery at different joints, different recipes, uh, combinations of fiber, and I found cornstarch to be my go-to binder, um, different types of assemblies in the armature, and just really experimenting with all the options and get an idea of what works and what doesn't. Um, taking all the lessons learned from this piece, I was able to create what came to be known as Chair 3 Chunky, um, which is a gross overcompensation and strength. There was a lot of insecurity in myself and those around me in terms of like what's possible with fiber. And this is before I even got in, got into the conversation around paper making craft, history of paper making, all the materials that are available to the paper world. Um, I was working with grocery bags and cornstarch and yeah, made this big bulky guy. Um, the shape is very much rooted in its structure. This one, the armature wasn't very strong, but there were some key moments that were super strong. So I really leaned into those, exploited them and just created this grid structure that allowed for something that was lightweight, but still super rigid. So I made these huge profiles, uh, finally got it to dry after a few weeks. And this thing is, it turned out to be built like a tank. Um, so much so that even the armature had a really impressive uh, strength to weight ratio, which is the object on the right. Um, so light, I call it lift with a pinky light um, and still super strong. Like you could stand on it. I don't know if you would dance on it. You could dance on the one on the left, but you could sit comfortably and for long periods of time in the one on the right. But I wanted to explore that, refine it, and ended up creating a second iteration of it where I just changed the geometry of the cardboard armature, added some curves to create more rigidity in the joints, and basically just wrapped it in craft paper, hardened with some cord starch. So a very traditional compostable paper mache approach. Um, great chair, great piece. You can't dance on it, but you can sit on it very comfortably. 
And it's the kind of object that can last as long as you need it to last indoors and then compost at end of life. So in terms of the original prompt, I feel like we had a lot of success here and I wasn't quite ready to move on, but I wasn't sure which direction to go except to refine the process uh, for the chunky chair. And that brought me to the object that um, NHP selected for the sustainability and chaos show. Um, this is right before this chair is when I met Daniel Heyman, stumbled into his paper studio, and he opened up this whole world of paper making to me and just was super generous with his knowledge, super generous with his space, and was always there to just answer a question when I had it, whether it was in person, by text, by phone. Um, super helpful for me just in the short amount of time that I have in grad school to really take in a lot of information and play with it. Um, I wasn't told to adhere to a very specific traditional practice. It was, here's cotton, here's abaca, here's kozo, here's what all these fibers do. So because of the price point, I immediately went towards uh, cotton linters and definitely something more fibrous than the post-consumer paper pulp or grocery bags that I was using initially. So I thought I could get that profile much smaller or much uh, thinner. And that's what I did here. So I'll go through the process of how I made this chair. Uh, again, starting with a cardboard armature that's been refined in form a few times. Um, a lot of binding after that, binding with cotton muslin to reinforce the joints that might be vulnerable, joints where the seat back meets the seat, where the seat meets the legs. And then from there, I use the cotton linters in what I've come to call a, a fiber clay that I make with a lot of different fibers. In this case, I made it with cotton linters and the cornstarch, and I mo hand mold that to the armature, uh, let it dry over a period of a few days. And then I wanted to play a little more with the mark making. So this is where things started getting very interesting for me, very engaging, and really just worlds started opening up. Um, so I coated the entire piece in uh, Real Milk Paint. It's a company based out of Tennessee. They make all natural, uh, pigmented paints using a uh, protein base found in milk, hence milk paint. And then I started removing the layers of the black and something super interesting started happening. The bright white cotton linters and the black from the milk paint had this amazing contrast, but all the dust from the black really um, embedded itself in the cotton linters and created these all these different shades of gray, which ultimately resulted in this uh, granite-like surface, which was super exciting. Um, this was the mark making that I was looking for. Uh, this was a turning point in the, I guess, in the exploration side of this form. Um, from here, I've been playing with a lot of different finishes. Most recently, I found another collaborator, again, in Daniel Heyman's course, uh, Tony Torres, who was exploring amate paper making, which is a traditional Mesoamerican technique of taking bark fiber, doing the, uh, doing the cook, but then instead of um, breaking it down into tiny little fibers, it's like core fibers, um, you're smashing it into shape. You're creating a grid-like structure with the strands of bark, uh, with the cooked bark, and then you're smashing it into a piece of paper. So we were kind of taking a, we were doing a play on that traditional technique and creating ribbons instead. And then we would take the ribbons and wrap the, uh, wrap the armature of the chair. So at this point we've created, or I've created this form that I'm really attracted to. I've settled on the geometry of it. I have a, a way to create the profile that I think is a nice balance between strength and weight. And now I'm starting to explore different ways of either wrapping or binding it. In this case, we use the Amate technique uh, which came out, I think, super strong. Just it looks like something that's literally growing um, in vine or tree form in the shape of the uh, in the shape of the chair. So, super interesting piece. Um, since then, I'm gonna hop off the PowerPoint a little bit just to show a few other pieces made with handmade paper um, using a chicken wire form where I make a very traditional, um, very familiar lamp, table lamp shape. And then I smash it and I use that as the shape to apply a couple layers of muslin and then layers of patch, patchwork handmade paper. 
Um, and then I remove the uh, internal form because that's a form that I want to reuse. And I ultimately want the final object to still be all natural and compostable. So what you see here beside the lighting, besides the lighting assembly is a 100% compostable um, object that we could live with. There's the chair again, uh, close up of the chunky. And then this is a credenza that Tony and I also worked on at the same time uh, we did the chair. Um, just thinking about what moving parts look like, still leaning into the paper, the Amate paper making technique, but bringing it into, I guess, something that myself and Tony identify with more, just not only a fascination with Mesoamerican history, uh, but also the Mexican heritage that we share. Uh, so slowly as the project went on, we found it to be very in tune with the Aztec calendar, the 260 day calendar. And we decided to use Tony's talents and create uh, the 20 glyphs on the backside represent, each represents a 13 day month within that 260 day uh, Mayan calendar. And then just a few photos. This was the credenza before the uh, Amate credenza. Um, this was a practice with abaca fibers, as well as cotton fibers. And I use nine layers of milk paint infused cotton fibers to spray on one layer at a time to get that, uh, that wild color that's uh, apparent on the surface. And then we casted uh, bronze in the shape of these little nubs. These, I, I mean, they're basically hand rolled spheres, but we've been calling them these uh, pulp nubs that show up if you look closely, they show up in a lot of the work and we cast them in bronze as the door poles for this piece. And then a few other shots. So that's the work so far. I don't want to keep anybody too long, but I will say thank you so much, Jerusha, for including me in this. Um, thank you, NHP, for the uh, two exhibitions that we've had in Providence and Atlanta. Thank you, um, RCW Paper Museum. And thanks, everyone, for... Uh, sticking around just a little bit longer. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. If you guys uh, don't mind holding on for just a couple of questions. Um, we've got one for Marjorie. They ask, can you talk about how your experience in theater affects your current practice? How were the seeds of art making in your uh, time as a collaborative production artist? Mm -hmm. um yeah it, when you're a studio artist i i do miss the collaboration part which is partially why I, there's always a community element to most of the things i do like i was showing people coming in and helping me roll paper so theater um it, it's really my foundation you know i i was doing it from seventh grade on and so um the whole idea of scale um, like I talked about the illusion so in theater things are always flying up out of out of sight and coming back in and so um, much of my work is flown rather than comes you know I'm a sculptor but almost all of my work comes from above rather than from the floor or the ground or um, so I think it and then my use of materials and my ability to pivot in that because in theater you have six weeks to build a production so you're creating a narrative um, for actors to work upon um, that tells part of the story and then once that's done you move on to the next thing and so if you go to my website, you'll see I use all sorts of materials um, to create the stories I'm trying to tell. It's just most recently, I this past five years, I've kind of taken color out of my work to focus on form and um, just to really dig deep into what paper's all about. And I'm not done yet. So thank you. Samuel, can you... Maybe tell I'm I'm curious about the strength like you're saying you um have been experimenting now with the Amate. Do you see a difference in the um strength of the um piece, you know, with the kind of wrapping that happens with the Amate versus kind of packing the pulp? 
Yeah, so specific to the chair, the Amate is very surface. It's very, um, it's a shallow part of the of the chair. Most of the strength is coming from the, in that piece, it was post-consumer paper pulp, so grocery bags, pulp down. And that's where the, practically all the strength is coming from. Um, what I found with the credenza, which is all Amate paper, the fact that it's, we actually used, I think traditional Amate papers uh, uses uh, a ficus, a species of ficus. We were using mulberry bush. We were using Kogo, Kozo fiber. And I, yeah, I mean, Kozo fiber is just, you know, it's the strongest. So definitely all the strength in the credenza is coming from the fact that we used Kozo fiber, which I'm not, I can't say from experience if the ficus has the same strength as the mulberry bush. How, how, how are you testing the weight, like the the strength properties? Are you just putting weights on it until it starts to bow or what? Like, well, with the you... chair, I'm literally just jumping on it. Like it's nothing real formal, except people don't believe me that it's made of paper. They don't believe me that it's strong. Um, so, you know, I show them where the material comes from and then I jump on it <laughs> just to show like confidence in what I'm doing and what I'm talking about. Uh, there's a few videos online somewhere. <laughs> uh, John, can you, um, once you, once you're cast the, uh, separate parts, are you, are you seaming those together with strips of, 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 um, wet, uh, paper or are you just like, how, how are you, how are you? Um, seaming it together once you've done that? Uh, when I first started uh, taking the sections and lining them up, and of course you try to shape them to where they line up with the least amount of, uh, uh, of uh, gaps, right? You, you sand them and shape them to you kind of can eliminate as many gaps as you can. You get a pretty snug fit. Uh, once you have that, then to, to make our fine, my final uh attachment is on the inside i used to go in with paper pulp just on the inside uh, and and maybe add a little bit of glue to that but uh, what i found i just take a paper towel and uh, make what i call homemade tape and put a, a la slather a layer of uh pva glue right yeah, polyvinyl acetate or mm -hmm. regular old elmer's white glue right and just put us a layer of, of that on there and so it's got a flouncy piece of homemade tape and then jam and in some cases i have to reach way up in there some of the long shapes i go way up in there so it's sort of a challenge to reach up and uh my, my, my hand won't fit or i use a stick or whatever to try to jam that uh paper up in to bridge the gap between the the two sections, as it were. And so uh, it's a matter of just gluing and attaching, taking a paper towel, say, for example. Um, I use a lot of paper towels. I use paper towels to eliminate the water and I end up using paper towels to bind the stuff together with a, with a little bit of PVA glue. And it's only on the interior or are you- oh, it's on only the on the interior, only oh. on the interior. That's why you want to get on the outside lined up as best as you can gotcha. and uh, sometimes i'll even if i have a seam still showing on the outside i'll put a little bit of spackling compound in there lightweight spackle okay <laughs> and that but it <laughs> blends real nice and sands out you know uh and then it paints up without any kind of uh, color variation at all yeah so and i guess i am cheating a little bit there <laughs> when i put a little spackle on there but it's just you know uh what they put on walls sheetrock walls that you know sheetrock is covered with paper and it's a it, it binds really nicely with it yeah so getting all the tricks tonight and um <laughs> Kristen, you mentioned this um uh metal paint what is the the texture like is are the are the metal bits in it um so fine that it paints smoothly or or like what is that experience because i'm 
trying to visualize. I know. I didn't have any photos of me painting it or of the paint. It was a product I got from Dick Blick. Um, I, I have all sorts of bags of iron dust and rust and all sorts of bags of metal in the studio. So I'm just curious, not only just with casting, um, but also to work with like the dust as a printing medium. Um, so I would say it's similar to like a glue, like a, like maybe a, like maybe some, I'm trying to remember. It's like, it felt very much like a, like a, like Elmer's glue. Maybe I'm being inspired by John, <laughs> but um, yeah. And the, the challenge to it is that it has, I think it's a sealant that has very fine iron powder, uh, fine mesh iron powder in it, suspended in it somehow, like some kind of chemical suspension maybe it is just elmer's glue and iron dust but it doesn't rust when you paint it on you have to force it to do that so you can get all sorts of different kind of metallic paints that have actual little powdered metals in it i was surprised uh because when i saw it i thought i for sure it was going to be screen print and then you just like flocking you know powdering the um uh clear medium with the metal dust that's what I like originally when I had the idea, that's what I thought about doing, but then I thought the screens will just get clogged immediately. So I, um, I've since developed a, a method of printing with iron using stenciling and like spray adhesive. And I use that to create a series of artist books I mentioned in my um, answer to the question. So yeah, it's a, it's an ongoing experiment. And <laughs> um, uh, one last, can, can you, the, um vacuum table did you you built the vacuum table yes i built the vacuum table over a decade ago um using marine grade plywood and i kind of looked it up online a little bit i think it would build it differently today um but i still have it and i still use it so <laughs> you know like uh it's not broke but it's a three by four foot table made out of yeah that marine grade plywood to stand up to the water sealed with silicone caulk and then little like rows of there's like ribs there's a there's a there's a false bottom and there's some ribs that are underneath the layer that you could see in the photo and then there's little I would say eighth inch holes that have been countersunk that run along the top of the table that's the hardest part those always get clogged with pulp um mm -hmm. as hard as I try to not let them get clogged and then um you fill it with water and then uh, disperse the pulp. If you're doing a full sheet, you disperse the pulp over that uh, felt and then um, lay like a plastic sheet over the top of the water and then let the water drain out and vacuum out the whatever remains. I've used it to make um, those pants castings um, I've and, uh, and other castings. It just helps add strength to the final object to, to vacuum it. Without that, without that vacuum, um, it wouldn't have any strength to it. Just like if I just let the pulp settle onto it. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys so much for taking the time to uh, share with us. Um, actually, one last question. That, Samuel, I'm the, the cornstarch. What exactly is a, the corn cornstarch doing? Because the, the, you know, paper, the fibers bind, they want to bind like, uh, John was saying, you know, just the kind of water and the fibers themselves want to bind. So, um, do you, are you uh, do you understand exactly what's going on with the uh, pulp and cornstarch combination? What scientifically, you I can't explain it. In? Oh, that's yeah. Scientifically, I can't explain it. Um, but the, yeah, the strength that it provides is pretty impressive. It's my whole thought just approaching it from a design perspective was, okay, fiber, probably not enough um, to be furniture. So we need to make a compound, something that has something fibrous and something that has a, that would act as a binder and cornstarch, not in its powder state, but when you add water and it, like boiling water and it congeals, then it becomes this like gelatin, like pudding, like texture. And then that mixed with the fiber is where like it becomes a clay. And yeah, again, I don't know exactly what happens, but. Okay, so you're making almost like a, a paste, a wheat paste kind of. 
Yeah, it's very it's, similar to a wheat paste, a rice paste. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Because I'm imagining you just kind of flaking this powder in. Oh, no. <laughs> in Think the, of it like the, too much sizing. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. Because that was, um, I couldn't leave without asking that. Um, I really appreciate you guys um, being so generous with your process, your time. Um, your techniques and um, uh, sharing some of the inspiration to kind of where you're, uh, you know, how you got to where you're at. So thank you so much. Um, if for the folks that are still on here, I hope that you will uh, join us for the final um, talk. Um, I should say that the contact um, links are in the uh, in the chat, and there's one for for John as well in the chat. Um, but I hope that you will uh, join us for the third and final talk. Um, this is an image of the work in uh, currently in the space at the Paper Museum. Um, if you want to help support with the donation, we we <laughs> we would um, welcome that. But our final talk is paper in three D, um, and just like tonight, the the all of the artists that are included in the show are just amazing, and um, you you'll be in for a treat if you if you uh, join us. So Tuesday at um, April second. Uh, same time, uh, eight uh, starting at eight p.m. Eastern time. And I, if you want to check out more about the Paper Museum, um, you can um, visit our website paper.gatech.edu. We're also on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and um, Pinterest. Uh, if you search RCW uh, Museum or RCW Paper Museum, we um, Will, will pop up. If you'd like to join the newsletter so that you um, get in your email when we're having um, uh, programming, um, contact anna.doll at rbi.gatech.edu. Thanks so much for joining us.